I would like us to reach back in our memories just to, uh, what was it, three weeks ago when I spoke the last time, and consider again the foundation materials that Jesus mentions in Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27. Remember, we, I talked quite a bit about the rock that we are to build on and the sand that we are not to build on. And the contrast between rock and sand is very stark. We went over the fact that in the Greek text, uh, rock is Petra. And a Petra is a very large, massive rock. Mr. Armstrong used to call it a big crag of a rock, um, like the rock of Gibraltar. It could even be a, an entire mountain range, according to those who make uh, Greek lexicons. But it's a, a massive, solid, immovable, that is a fixed, uh, single edifice. It is one. It's a unit. It's not made up of many things. And it endures for ages. This is the image that we get from a Petra, a great cliff or a mountain uh, that is a, just solid rock. And it's, it's one piece of rock that never will be moved. And uh, uh, it will endure forever. Sand, on the other hand, the Greek word amos, A-M-M-O-S, is the very opposite of the great Petra that we would see, like the rock of Gibraltar. It's tiny, little grains of sand are, are almost microscopic. Uh, they're loose, that is they move a lot, they shift. Uh, sand, normally when we think of it, is not a particular, one particular grain of sand. We usually think of many grains of sand that make up a beach or you know some, some surface that, that uh, is very large and has all these small bits in them that make up what we would call sand. And it is transient. It'll, it's easily moved. It can be washed away. Um, it could even be blown away if the wind is strong enough. So it's not something that's going to endure. And as I mentioned in the last sermon, in terms of stability and long-term viability, the rock's qualities are all positive. I mean, if you're going to build on something or want something to last, you want to put it on the rock. And the sand's qualities, if you want to call them that, are all negative in terms of, like I say, stability and long-term viability. Now, we know, because we've read the Bible, we've studied it, you know, we know it from cover to cover, at least I hope we do, or if we don't, that we're coming to know it from cover to cover. But we know that Jesus Christ or the Lord of the Old Testament, is called the rock. It's mentioned in several places. Uh, the first one I thought of was, of course, 1 Corinthians 10, 4, when, where Paul says that the Israelites followed that rock, and that rock was Christ. It, you know, that rock was Christ. It, it's uh, obvious whom he meant. Uh, it's also all through Moses' song in Deuteronomy 32. And David also, in some of the Psalms, uh, also calls him our rock. I can think of, uh, well, Psalm 18 has several allusions, or at least two allusions to uh, Christ as the rock. And he is all of those things that the bedrock or the rock that Jesus uh, mentions in Matthew 7 represents. He's God. He cannot be moved. He never changes. He is sovereign. He is our, as it says in uh, Ephesians 4, he is our one Lord. So he's unitary in that sense. He is everlasting. He is immortal. He will never die. He'll go on forever. And so if we build on the rock, we'll never go wrong. If we stay attached to him, and we stay faithful to him. But I can tell you, I can guarantee to you that none of us do it perfectly, that we all have room for improvement. 
Many of us, sometimes I, I think, and I know this of myself, so I can say it with some confidence, that many of us assume we're doing it pretty well. Hey, I've grown. I, 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 I understand this. You know, I'm, I'm with it. I'm never going to be moved. And that's when we, we have a big trial and, and we have to think, oh, well, I, I should be more humble about that. But in every case, in every human who has been converted to God's way of life, if we were to inspect that person's foundation, our inspection would reveal an awful lot of sand under our foundation, or on our foundation. On is better. And the reason for this is we are human. We are flawed. We're limited, quite limited. We lack a lot of insight, both to ourselves and to the world. We don't see things properly. We oftentimes see good when it's actually not good, but we're comfortable with it, and so we think that it's okay. Another thing about human being is that we get tired. Things happen in our lives, and we let things slip because we're just, we just don't feel like we have the energy to do anything. Or we are neglectful. That also happens because we have uh, that. Al that also happens because we're such busy people, and we have only so much time and a lot to do, and so we we try to prioritize. And oftentimes we prioritize badly, and neglect what is actually uh, more important. Or we can just simply be lackadaisical, a bit lazy about our calling and just let things slide. We have a tendency, like the people that Paul or whoever it was wrote the epistle to the Hebrews to, to let things slip. That's what he told them. He starts the first chapter off, look at your great redeemer. Look at all that he's done. God has placed him above all things. Even the angels bow to him. And then the first thing he says in chapter 2 is, we got to make sure we don't let these things slip away and neglect our great salvation because we all have the tendency to allow that to happen just because we get busy or you know certain things happen and distract us and suddenly weeks, months, years go by and we find ourselves uh, lacking faith because we let things slip. Now, a major reason for many of us is that we've given a pass to certain sand in our foundations because we're comfortable with that sand. It may be that we have mistakenly considered that sand as godly or as somehow divinely approved. In other words, if I can use the analogy, we look at the sand, but we see rock because our eyes have been blinded one way or the, or the other to see this certain ungodliness as godly or as normal or as okay or as God wouldn't mind. We have a lot of ways of justifying ourselves and what we do, and that's just the deception of Satan or our own self-deception where we consider bad things to be good. And we need further insight from God to see them in their true light as what they really are, sand rather than rock. Only when a crisis comes, and this is Jesus' point in in, uh, in Matthew 7, only when a crisis comes and it ruins what we have built do we actually realize that that thing has been sand all along when we thought it was rock 
and it has been steering us away from God in its own way for a long time, causing us not to see the truth, uh, reality, as God sees it. Now, it's my hope that with a bit more insight into both ourselves and into God's purpose and the, the total depravity of this world, a bit, a bit more critical thinking, if you will, a bit more, probably a lot more humility, and a bit more urgency and effort, we will be better able to spot the sand under our buildings and dig it out, get rid of it, remove it. Isn't that not what examining ourselves is all about? As Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we are coming up to the Passover. Today is a full moon. I think it's at 99% today. That means two moons until Passover. So we need to start thinking about this very seriously. What sand do we need to sweep away? I know it seems like I just can't let go of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Not just yet. This is actually not really supposed to be one of my Sermon on the Mount uh, sermons. I just had more thoughts about this, this uh, foundational parable, this fourth warning. I thought I would do another sermon. So this sermon, like the last one, will center on Christ's final warning about the foundation we build our converted lives on. However, this is where I, I use my own human reason here to justify myself. I want to shift our focus on this point to Luke's version of this parable. And that's in the Sermon on the Plain, not the Sermon on the Mount. Because it has a few significant differences in wording that can give us additional insight into what Jesus was trying to say. So uh, let's start in, in Matthew 7. I want to read the one that's in the Sermon on the Mount again, just so we refresh ourselves. And then we'll go to Luke 6 and read what he said to the multitudes. Remember, Sermon on the Mount was to the disciples. Sermon on the Plain was to the multitudes. So... We'll take what we can from that. But let's uh, first start in Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall calamitous was its collapse another way of, of rendering that in more you know stark language okay let's go to uh, Luke 6 and see the uh, the same parable, this is Luke 6, 48, or excuse me, 46, Luke 6, 46. We'll see it in a slightly different form here. He says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Now, start, start tallying up the differences here. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. 
All right. There are significant differences between the two parables. Now, I want to give you four main ones. There are a few others as well, uh, but I want to concentrate on these. Number one is that Luke combines the gist of the third warning, that is, the third warning was Jesus' condemnation of lawlessness and disobedience with the fourth warning. So he, he's scrunching the third and fourth warnings together because they do go together. That's why the fourth one follows the third one. It's on a similar theme. So we see that he takes the gist of number three and he adds it as the basis for what happens in number four. So it implies, Luke's version implies more directly that failing to do as Christ commands is the reason for so many building on the sand. If they would listen to what he said, then they would have every reason to build on the rock. But they aren't listening to him. They aren't doing what he says. And so they fail to build on the foundation of the rock. So if we would truly listen to Christ and do what he says, we would build more correctly and successfully. We would build an, uh, an enduring structure. And this only makes sense. That's why he gives us commands. That's why he gives us his law. His commands are there to create us in the spiritual image of God so we can live that eternal life of God in his kingdom. And so his commands are helpful. His commands are good. His commands lift us up and show us the right way to go. But if you don't listen to them and you don't put them into practice, they'll do you, do you no good. And if you try to build something, you're going to end up building something that's faulty, that's very flawed. And this more than implies that ignoring his instructions about life dooms us to, dis to disaster. There is no way that by ignoring what Christ has taught us or, or what wants to teach us, that's a better way to put it, um, that we can actually build something that works. It's impossible. So we have to uh, do what he says if we want to build anything uh, of any lasting nature or of any good nature because only his words are the words of life. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 5. He tried to teach this to Israel. He tried to show them the benefits of following his way. Of course, we know that uh, they failed spectacularly and as the author of Hebrew says, Hebrews says, their bodies were scattered across the wilderness because they did not build anything that was lasting. They died. Let's go to uh, chapter 5, Deuteronomy 5. We're going to start in uh, verse 29. We'll go all the way through the end of the chapter. So verse 29 here, Deuteronomy 5. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always, and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Go and say to them, he's talking to Moses here, return to your tents, but as for you, stand here by me, and I will speak to you all the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which you shall teach them, that they may observe them in the land which I am giving them to possess. Therefore, you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. So this is what he says will happen if we hear him and do his word. Now let's drop down in chapter 6 to verse 10. And it shall be 
When the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not uh, fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you, for the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you and that you may go in and possess the good land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to cast out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has spoken. And this back and forth between doing what is good, doing, keeping the commandments, following the statutes and the judgments versus falling away from him, but being idolatrous, disobeying his voice, goes on for another like six chapters. It's just back and forth where he tells them, I will do this if you obey me, and this will come upon you if you disobey me. He gives them a long, long oration about the good that will come to them if they obey and the enduring uh, nation that they would build and how uh, the other nations would come to them and say, teach us all of this because you're a wonderful nation and you have so much wisdom. And then he tells them the other side, if you fall away from that, those nations are going to come to you with swords and they're going to destroy you. So which do you want? And of course, he gets all the way to chapter 30 and he says, look, I'm placing this choice before you, life or death, blessing or cursing, what you want, it's yours to decide. So in the New Testament, in this particular uh, paragraph that we're studying, the choice is rock or sand. Obedience, do what I say, build on the rock, or sand, which is don't build. As a matter of fact, in Luke it says, don't even build a foundation, just build on the sand and get swept away and die. That's the choice. It's always been the same. Follow God, live don't follow God, die. Follow God, eternal life. Don't follow God, eternal death. It's really simple. Even a caveman can understand. <laughs> so that's, that's what he gives us here in this uh, parable in Luke 6. Okay, let's go to the second difference between the two versions. In Luke's version... The wise builder digs deep and lays the foundation on the rock. In Matthew's version, back in Matthew 7, it more uh, directly points to Christ being the rock, or being the foundation, I should say. So Luke's version suggests the house's foundation is laid on the rock, whereas Matthew's makes a point that the rock is Christ. They're slightly different, but Luke's version, as you would expect, is more in line with Paul's analogy of building. And let's go to there in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, just to see it, so you know what I'm talking about. 1 Corinthians 3, and we'll read verses, uh, right at the end of verse 9 through 11. So we'll pick it up... Uh, where he says, you are God's building. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, you are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So here he combines them a little bit. He says, yes, the foundation is Christ, but he also says, I laid the foundation 
on the rock. He's looking at it from a minister's point of view. And so it's a little bit different here. But the idea is that Paul's faithful teaching of the gospel provides the foundation one builds upon. And so the gospel is about the things that Christ taught, his message that he, he taught. And so Paul, coming alongside the new member, gives him the materials for that foundation, which are all built on the rock. Slightly different. And he says another minister can come uh, uh, later on and build either good or bad and the teach, by the teachings that he gives. So it's, like I said, it's slightly different, but Luke's is a little bit more in alignment with Paul's. But it, it just shows how deeply layered this analogy can get, uh, looking at it from, a, from several different perspectives. However, back to Luke 6. We should not pass over that Jesus says here in Luke 6 that the wise master builder digs deep. So... You have this idea that the wise master builder comes upon a piece of property, whatever it is, and all he sees is hard pan, sand. And it, the hard pan actually looks stable. That's how it is over in Israel. The ground actually looks very stable with the sand because it's been packed, it's been dry, and so everything is compressed and it looks like it's very stable. But the wise master builder knows that it's actually dirt. It's sand, it's not rock, even though it's, it's pretty hard. And so he makes the effort to go and dig out the sand that's there, just packed down, till he actually strikes the bedrock and he puts his foundation there. He's not content with saying, oh, this has made my job easy. I can just put it right here. It's not going to fall, you know, float away in a, in a, in a, a storm because this is hard. Huh, I, I could hardly put my a dent in it. It must be great. But no, the wise master builder doesn't trust how packed that dirt is. He wants to get to rock that he knows will be immovable, that he knows will be solid. So in Luke, in Jesus' parable in Luke, he builds an image here of a person making strenuous effort to remove the soil or the sand from the place he wants to build. That he really digs down deep. He puts a lot of, of his blood, sweat, and tears to get down to the bedrock because he won't be satisfied until every grain of sand, if you will, has been cleared from his building site. And he knows that his foundation is going to be solid. Now, this is parallel to other analogies in the Bible that we all know. It pictures getting rid of sin or getting rid of wrong ideas, wrong ways of thinking, and uh, bad habits that we built over the years. We know these analogies as removing leaven from our our homes or from our lives, actually. Putting off the old man is another analogy. It's like taking off clothing, taking off those bad habits and sins and other things that we have had uh, as unconverted people. Um, Paul talks about leaving his rubbish behind because he wants to go on to the perfection of Christ. He he wants to throw away everything of the old way so that he could embrace Christ in the new way that he had been shown. 
And that's what we have to do. And of course, there are corresponding analogies to the negatives, that is, eating unleavened bread, as opposed to getting rid of leavened bread, or uh, putting on the new man, as opposed to taking off the old man, or growing in grace and knowledge, as opposed to leaving the knowledge and our way of life that we had before behind. So it's, we always get with God uh, a negative and a positive because we need to clear out the bad so we could fill that space with the good. Let's go to Ephesians 4, if you will. Ephesians 4, we'll start in verse 17. This is right after he had talked about the ministry's job is to equip people so that they could come into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, among other things. And so he starts into this analogy about the new man. We'll read down from uh, 17 to 24 here. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Listen to these descriptions here. In the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to licentiousness or lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. He's the opposite of all these things. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That is, if you've had a wise master builder that has laid the proper foundation, you know that Jesus is nothing like as he described the way the Gentiles walk. Verse 22, so he's telling us that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God, that is, according to his example, according to his way, according to his character in righteousness and true holiness. So, we can use these, the words from, uh, or the ideas from Matthew 7 and Luke 6. The apostle makes it clear here that we have come out of a culture built on sand. The whole world is built on sand. And he describes them, this sand, the little grains of sand, as futility. Solomon talked about vanity. That's what he means. Misunderstanding, he says. Alienation from God. Ignorance. Unconcern. He past feeling that they're unconcerned about others, about God, about many things. Uh, he mentions lewdness. We see a lot of that in our culture today. Uncleanness, that too. Corruption, yes, we see a lot of that. Deceit, and many other things beside that Paul didn't mention. That's a lot of negatives that we came out of. That's a lot of sand that we need to sweep away. And maybe we weren't all that bad where we were the, the poster child for these things, but we still had elements of them. We've all been greedy. We've all been lustful. We've all been corrupt. We've all done things that we are ashamed of now that we know that, that uh, those things are wrong. We were all ignorant. We were all unfeeling about certain people or certain good and godly things. We had elements of these things. 
We all lived futile lives. We were all alienated from God. So Paul says here, we have to get rid of these things. We have to sweep all this sand away. We have to dig deep and get down to bedrock and then start building good things on that bedrock that come from him, from from the rock, from Christ. So these things that Paul mentioned here about the way the Gentiles walk, you could say the unconverted walk, all these things should be dead to us as Christians. We should not give them a bit of our time except to sweep them away. But we don't. We, we figure out that some of them are bad and we stop doing them, but others we cling to. I don't know why. Because we're stupid? That may be it. We're human, that's maybe a better answer. We're still deceived in certain areas, self-deceived in many cases. And so we cling to them and don't overcome, don't repent. So in order to dig down deep and to sweep these things away, we have to have things like faith and diligence and be dedicated to the work. And we have to push our sleeves up and get to work. We actually have to do something. We have to put in the effort. Not just think about it. No, we should. We've got to jump in in the hole that we've already started digging. Maybe it's just a slight depression, but we've got to get in there with our shovels and start digging out the sand. We can't let time pass by. We don't know how long we have. We need to get in there and start digging out till we hit the rock in every area uh, of our lives so that we're firmly founded on the rock in everything. And yes, I will warn you, and you probably already know this, all that work and faith and diligence and dedication doing those things are going to cause pain. It is hard to sweep away the sand because we like the sand. We're connected to the sand. The sand connects us to other people that we love. And to do what Christ wants us to do We have to put him first and perhaps sacrifice relationships. Sacrifice what we like doing. All those things cause, usually it's an emotional pain, but there may be physical pain too. But that's the reason why we are so reticent about doing such things because we know that it's going to hurt. Even if it just hurts our schedule, we don't want to do it. I don't want to get up a half hour earlier to pray because I need my sleep. And so we make justifications to ourselves for why we leave the sand. So... It's difficult work, but it's work that has to be done throughout our converted lives because we often fail to see the evil in these things until God reveals them to us. Or worse, there are secret loyalties that our human nature holds on to desperately, and even though we know they're there, we refuse to give them up. David talked about secret sins. He wanted help from God to get over them so he wouldn't grasp them so much so he could let them go. And we're all like David. We all have those things. We just need to screw up our courage and face them and overcome them. Easier said than done. Now, Getting back to to Matthew versus Luke on this idea of the foundations, 
Some say that Matthew's version stresses where one builds, that is, on Christ, that is, either rock or sand, but we prefer to be on the rock, that's where Christ is. And Luke's version, on the other hand, focuses on how one builds. That is, we either build with wisdom and great effort, or, keep losing my faith, my place here, or we uh, build with folly and laziness. Again, that's the choice. Wisdom and diligent effort, folly and laziness. Which one are you going to choose to do? And this idea that the, the two parables uh, have these different foci um, is, is right, I think. It has merit. So Matthew stresses where one builds, while Luke focuses on how one builds. All right, let's go on to the third significant difference between these two parables. In Luke 6, Jesus mentions no storm and no wind explicitly. Here in, in Luke 7, I better get back there. Uh, here in Luke 6, excuse me, the crisis is a flood. Now in Matthew uh, 7, the crisis is, is a storm flood and wind, all three of them. This one is particularly the flood, a flood that comes and sweeps the building away if you're foolish or sweeps past the building if you're building uh, like a wise master builder. So the crisis is a flood here. We've got to think of the, we've got to think of the imagery of a flood because in this particular place, God wants us to focus on a flood rather than the storm, the stream, and the, and the uh, winds. So we've narrowed it down to just a flood. That is a powerful, gushing stream of water. Now the Greek word underneath flood here in Luke is is Plemira, oh uh, no, Plemira, Plemira, P-L-E-M-M-Y-R-A, Plemira. It's a flood tide, or uh, I should say it's like the flood tide of a sea, or uh, the overflowing of the banks of a river, which would also uh, create a flood. It's describing the occasion when water breaks out of its banks and sweeps everything before it. That's what Plymira is. Plymira. That's for some reason I have a hard time with that. So it is rushing water. We could even consider it a wave, like a tidal wave. That would be the ultimate in Plymira. Now, the flood from way, way back, has been an image of a crisis from time of Noah, at least. It brings calamity. It is a cataclysm that sweeps everything before it to destruction. It's that powerful. One cannot stand in a flood of this strength, of this, that is this mighty. And think of the Noatian flood. It destroyed all humanity, except for those eight people who heard God's sayings and did them. Isn't that how it starts here? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them, I will show you who he's like. Wise builder. So their obedience, they're listening to God, hearing what he had to say, and doing what he said, made sure that they lived. They endured through a calamity because they were founded on the rock, if you will. 
Their rock at that point, physically, was a boat. Built because Noah believed God and did what he said. All right, let's go back to Hebrews 11 and see exactly that. Hebrews 11. This is verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Okay, that was the saying of the Lord, the saying of Christ, the warning that he gave. Moved with godly fear, he respected God and what he said, and he was determined then to follow the saying, follow the warning, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So Noah is a good example of the wise master builder, or the wise builder, if you will, uh, from the from the parable because he heard Christ's sayings and did them. And because he did them, that is, built an ark, he was saved. He endured. He did not get swept away in the flood. And it saved the lives of his entire household. Their faith was in the rock. They were founded on the rock. And there are examples of this all through the Bible. When people listen to God, they are safe and they endure when they do what he says. We just have to update all those, those examples to our own time that if we listen to God, we do what he says, then that's a proof that we're founded on the rock and we will endure. Like I said, easy to say, hard to do. Let's go to Revelation 12. Just search out this uh, flood imagery just a little bit. Revelation 12. And we'll read verses 15 and 16. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Okay, another example of a flood being a major crisis here. Now we remember that Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 36 through 39, that the end time will be like the time of Noah, before the flood. At the very least, a flood of water represents any kind of major crisis, any kind of se severe test, any trial, any tribulation. They are situations and circumstances with the potential to sweep us off our feet or in the language of the analogy, sweep us off our foundation and destroy everything that we have built. Usually a flood is a major trial, a major crisis. Sometimes it's not a flood, sometimes it's a fire. Uh, if we would go back to 1 Corinthians 3 and look at Paul's analogy, the, the crisis there is fire, that a fire will burn everything up if you built with... Uh, gold, silver, and precious stones, then you'll endure. But if you build with wood, hay, and stubble, that's going to be uh, destroyed. So um, same idea. Now back to the idea of a flood. My dad, years and years ago, speculated that the flood Satan spews out of his mouth at the church here is a deluge of words. Words, ideas, philosophies, uh, various deceits and falsehoods so he can sow confusion in the church and attempt to deceive God's people into believing his lies and so drift from God into apostasy. And so we have here at the end, as we believe, the information age where we have access to any kind of information we want and even information that that AI will think up for us. 
I'm not condemning AI, but I'm saying that the access to AI and using uh, the internet and all these computers to, to gather more and more information, uh, it's, it's upon us. And that's what my dad's article was called, The Flood is Upon Us. And that we have to be wary about the information that we allow into our minds because much of it is uh, aimed at drawing us away from God. So instead, we have to do what it says in John 7, verse 37. If we want to keep anchored to the foundation, we have to do what Jesus says here, John 7, 37. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. We don't want the flood that Satan spews out of his mouth. We want the pure sweet drink, if you will, from Christ. All right, let's go on to the fourth point, the fourth major difference here between Matthew and Luke in this parable. <clears throat> this one is that the foolish builder builds directly on the earth without a foundation. Notice that. Verse 49, Luke, uh, Luke 6, but he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation. That is, he builds with a lack of right knowledge, a knowledge of the truth. He doesn't have the wise master builder that Paul was who, who gave them the true gospel. There are many who think they know the true gospel, but they don't. They lack that foundation, and they, it causes them to build directly on the earth. Now notice it here that Luke says they built on the earth. He doesn't use sand. Now, the difference between sand and earth uh, can be significant if you want it to, but they both basically mean the same thing. But Luke's use of earth brings other thoughts into our mind. The word here in Greek for earth is ye, it's actually um, spelled G-E. In Greek, it's pronounced ye. But this is the foundational word for like geo, geology, and that sort of thing. It means the earth. Uh, it, it can also mean soil. It could mean ground. It could mean the surface of the earth, the land, as opposed to being a body of wadi, water, wadi. <laughs> Wadi sometimes is land and sometimes it's a body of water. Um, but land as opposed to sea or, or river. Or we could also think of it as a land, uh, a region, a territory, a country. Its word yea could mean any of those things. Now, in terms of being soil, which is the direct intent here that is put on the soil rather than on the rock, it is analogous to the sand in Matthew 7 because Israel's soil tends to be sandy. So sand and earth, soil, would mean very similar things to a, a native of that land. But it has a slightly different connotation as yea, as earth or soil rather than sand. I want to bring this out. This is the difference, or this brings out the dichotomy between heaven and earth. If you build on Christ, you're building on something heavenly. But if you build on the earth, you're building on something earthly. God, heaven is God's realm, while earth is Satan's realm and deceived man's realm. Heavenly things are perfect and glorious, while earthly things 
even its wisdom are sensual and demonic, as James says in James 3.15. Have you ever noticed that in Revelation 13.11, the false prophet is introduced as another beast coming out of the earth, showing his origin. He comes out of the earth speaking like a dragon and deceiving mankind with his tricks. By contrast, when we get to Revelation 19, the great king of, king, king of kings and lord of lords comes down out of heaven, showing the difference between the beast and false prophet and Jesus Christ. The beast, by the way, comes out of the sea, which is a different image of coming out of the turbulence of, of mankind. But uh, here in this parable, building on the rock, Jesus is making a similar contrast between rock and earth, or sand, in these parables. He's trying to get us to understand that building on the rock is a good and spiritual thing. It's a heavenly thing, if you will, whereas building on the soil, the earth, the sand, is earthy or earthly. So the rock, the sure foundation of Christ, as it says in Isaiah 28, 16, is spiritual and from heaven, from the Father. It's all good. Whereas the sand or the earth or the soil is material, it's physical, it's native to the earth and corrupt. Let's go to Second Peter uh, 3, Second Peter 3. And this is, this is interesting. I thought maybe uh, someday I'll, I'll do a full-blown sermon on this. We'll see. But uh, starting in verse 10, we'll read down through verse 13. And notice the, the difference here between heaven and earth. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, Second Peter 3.10, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, there's a couple of, well, well, I'll mention just one here to give you a better understanding, where it says the heavens will pass away with great noise, and then it goes on and talks about the heavens being dissolved. It doesn't mean the third heaven. It doesn't mean outer space. Necessarily, it means the sky. That means that envelope of air that's around the earth. That is what is going to be dissolved and the earth. So it doesn't mean heaven, heaven, where, where God is. It means what surrounds the earth. Everything that is earthy, which includes our atmosphere, will be dissolved, even down to the elemental level. That shows you that even though we think we, something on earth may be everlasting, it's not. God is the only thing that is truly everlasting. And so he says he's going to burn everything that has, has seen corruption up and start anew with a new heavens and a new earth. And this time around, the new earth and the new heavens will have never seen corruption. They will be full of righteousness and the Father himself will come down and reign from here and live here with us. So at this point, everything that's earthy, demonic, sensual, as, as James says, all those things will be totally obliterated, totally eradicated. And only the rock and those who follow him will have come through that to live for eternity. 
That's how important building on the rock is because we want to be built on the foundation that will allow us to go through this cataclysm. Remember I said sometimes the cataclysm is water, cataclysm is water, sometimes it's fire. This time it's fire here. All right, I want you to, want to read several scriptures here from the Apostle Paul. We'll start in 2 Corinthians 5, and I have uh, three other passages beyond this one that I want you to listen to. Listen to the way, uh, listen to the gist of what Paul is trying to say in each of these. They're very similar, but I want you to listen to them to get Paul's arguments and to see what he's trying to get across to us. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, 16. We'll read through verse 21, which is the end of the chapter. Starting in verse 16, he says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, that is, in our flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. He's mostly speaking about the ministry in this, this uh, particular instance, but it, it flows on to us in other occasions. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Remember, we were alienated from God. He's talking to converted people. And now he's saying, you still need to be reconciled to God because this is an ongoing process because when we're baptized, we, don't, we have our sins forgiven, but our human nature is still, in a broad sense, still carnal. Remember, this is the church that he talked about. You are still carnal. And he's trying to get that across to them. Be reconciled to God, he says, for he made him, that is Christ, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the idea here is that we've been given this, well, the ministry has been given this, this uh, ministry of reconciliation to help everyone in the church to come to be more like Christ. Simple terms. Okay, let's go to Ephesians 2. Just a few pages over. Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. He's making the, uh, the difference here between what it was like to be a Gentile and now to be called or being unconverted and now being converted. You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. This is more of the work of the ministry, more of your work in cooperation with God to become holy. Let's move on. Philippians 3, verses 17 through 21. Philippians 3, 17 through 21. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who have set their mind on earthly things. 
for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So he's saying that many have gone along this road and they've turned away because they love earthly things. But the whole business of, of Jesus Christ is to bring us to the resurrection so that we could live eternally with him. We don't want to give this up by being too anchored to this earth. Okay, let's go on one more place. Colossians, that's like just one page over for me. Colossians 1, verse 9 through 14, and then 21 through 23, starting in verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may, may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us, from the power of darkness and translated us or conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now let's go down to verse 21. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled, we come back to that word, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, and blameless and irreproachable in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Okay. Fantastic passages. They should lift us up and make us so grateful to God for what he has done and what he continues to do and the great hope that he has out there for us if we'll stay the course. Now, the gist of these passages, then, is that though we are still physical, we have been, as Paul says in Colossians, spiritually transferred or conveyed from the realm of the earthly to the realm of the heavenly. Right now, this is what we might call a legal transference because we are still physical. We still have flesh. But because of what Christ has done, he has allowed us through him to enter into the kingdom. We are part of the kingdom now. We are... As it says here, he has translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. So we are there on a legal basis right now, but our lives aren't finished. There are things that could happen, but, and so we need to endure to the end so that we can have the fullness of the kingdom in the resurrection from the dead. So in this period, while we're still alive as physical beings, before the coming of Jesus Christ, Christ, who is our rock, our redeemer, our high priest, is tasked by, the God, uh, by God the Father with transforming us spiritually, cleansing us of earthly things, teaching us the righteousness of God, and helping us pursue holiness. It's his job to prepare us for the kingdom of God. It's his job to get us to the point that when the Father says, go, we're ready. And we can be transformed into the full image of Christ. In the analogy in Matthew 7 and Luke 6, he is our foundation and we are his building. 
and he aids us as much as he can in our work of digging down to bedrock and sweeping away the sand. Because he's all for us. He wants us there. He wants to do his job. He wants to have our love and him love us for all eternity because that is the way of God. Okay, now to another scripture we're very familiar with, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Here's our part. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So Paul here gives us a concise version, version of our marching orders from Christ on this point. He says, do not be conformed to this world and prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we get rid of the worldly things, we put on the godly thing, okay? Pretty simple. We have to eliminate the negative and put on the positive. To put it into the heaven and earth dichotomy that we talked about earlier, we rid ourselves of any conformity to earthly things, that is this world, this cosmos, this human culture that has been influenced by Satan, and on the other side, we seek to know and inculcate into our character heavenly things. That is, God's righteousness, God's way of thinking, God's living or lifestyle, the way he lives all the time. And just so we're clear, this can only be done, as Paul shows in verse 1, by sacrifice. We have to give ourselves totally to this process and submit our will to God's. We can't hold anything back. If we do, it's pretty clear that there's sand that we need to get rid of. Let's remember, we've entered the new covenant with God. And as we saw last time in Luke 14, verse 25 to the end of the chapter, if we are truly his disciples then he must come first in everything. Before family, before nation, before any kind of cause, any kind of desire or passion that we have, he must come before our health, he must come before our employment, he, he has to come first in all categories. The new covenant is a binding, eternal agreement, and its primary demand of us is loving loyalty or faithfulness to God. We love God so much that we will follow or give our loyalties to no other. And you know what? If we give our loyalties or give our loyalty to some other, there's a word for that. Idolatry. And we know we don't want to have anything to do with idolatry. Now, what we've done in coming into the new covenant is that we've accepted the Old Testament concept of hesed, H-E-S-E-D. That is covenant loyalty. It's an agreement with God that we are going to be loyal to him and show him all our love and do everything he says. So we're loyal to the covenant, we're loyal to God. Okay, I hope I can get this in. Let's go to John 17. I'll just read this part, uh, verses 13 through 19. Jesus' prayer about us. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I had given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world. Catch that. His disciples are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. See, we've been transferred into the kingdom of the son of his love. I do not, uh, uh, where am I? Yeah, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I was going to go down through verse 19, but I think we could stop there. We could go to 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17, where he tells us, don't love the world. That's not God's way. They're going to pass away. God is eternal, though. If you stick with God and love God, then you're on the right road to eternal life. Revelation 18, verses 4 and 5 is a warning right at the end. Come out of her, my people. Come out of this Babylon of the world. You don't want to be a partaker of the plagues that are going to come upon her. Because if you don't come up, you're going to end up uh, suffering quite terribly. Okay, so as we come down to crunch time, it becomes more incumbent upon us to overcome the worldliness that remains in us. We've got to show that we are not of this world and that we reject this world. So we have to sweep away the sand. We have to get rid of earthly things that keep us from building strong, enduring, godly character upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. So as we finish here, I want to ask you a question. What is your sand? What is your sand? What worldly things are you clinging to? What ideas from this world still hold your loyalty? Martin and I were in the same class at AC, and we heard a longtime evangelist talking about a church doctrine. This was in the 80s, 87 or 88. He had been in the church since the early 50s at least. So it had been like three decades of being a minister in the Worldwide Church of God. And he said before the whole class, we Baptists believe, and then he went on and said whatever it was. And Martin and I were like some of you. Like, Did he really say that? It slipped out in a moment of thoughtless candor. But after 30 years of being an evangelist in the Worldwide Church of God, he still considered himself a Baptist. It's not surprising that he welcomed the Tkach administration's doctrinal changes that went back to Protestantism. I also knew a man for a couple of decades, a good, kind, long timer in the church. He left us, the Church of the Great God, when my dad preached that military service, killing for one's country, which he had done before his conversion, was sinful and should be repented of. But you see, he still carried his military, his wartime service to his country as a badge of honor. He could not get over that hill, that stumbling block to him. At heart, he was still a soldier. He was still fighting the war. I know a lot of people that still worship the God of American patriotism. They would do anything for this country. They believe this is God's country. And to them, patriotism is an act of worship. Some of them talk about the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution like they're a third testament of scripture. But look where these documents have brought us. It took about 250 years, but now we have a perverse post-Christian society. Loyalty to a country is fine, but not above loyalty to God. There are many people who worship the God of freedom. They believe that they can do whatever they want, whenever they want, and no one should tell them differently. Many have made gods of their tribe, whether it's a sexual tribe, a, a racial tribe, an ethnic 
tribe, a familial tribe, or some other division of, of humanity that they think is the greatest. Some of us are still Republicans or Democrats. Some of us believe in capitalism, some in socialism. Many people worship at the idol of money. Others crave power or prestige in the world. Some of us are environmentalists and some people are actively anti-environmental. Some bow at the suggestions of doctors and pharmaceutical companies while others make a god of natural healing rather than God. Others are immersed for long hours in music, art, sports, or any kind of diversion. So I ask you, what is your sand? Your sand is whatever separates you from your primary loyalty to Christ. Sand is idolatry. Now each of us in the next few weeks should take some time to see what sand we still cling to. Sand that holds us back from total devotion to God. When the flood comes, and it will come, to test us, will we be found futilely grasping at crumbling grains of sand? Or will be, we be found clinging to the rock? You have to answer that for yourself. Have a wonderful Sabbath, everyone. <laughs>